If you would take your Bibles and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 this morning, we're continuing with part 2 of Beyond the Shadows. And we're going to be starting today in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. As you're turning there, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. When you start looking at the previous chapter in chapter 2, you see where the Apostle Paul is warning the church over the coming apostasy, over the coming false teachers, Antichrist, the Antichrist, the falling away of the church, and he cautions them over all the things that are about to happen. Now when we start transitioning into chapter 3, he goes from warning the church, telling the church all these things are about to happen, encouraging them to stand fast, to asking for a prayer for himself and for his fellow leaders. And he starts off in verse 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you will do the things we command you, Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. This prayer that he asks, prayer for the leaders, prayer for the believers, one of the first requests he makes, and this is interesting when compared to chapter 2, one of the first requests he makes is a revival. That the Word of God would go swiftly throughout everywhere, increasing. That's a prayer for revival right there. Here in chapter 2, he just talks about the coming apostasy. He talks about the falling away. He talks about all these terrible, terrible things that we hear about even today. And one of the first things he asks for prayer for is revival. Now, boy, that's incredible, isn't it? I would think the first prayer I would pray is is to say, Lord, take me out. Just remove me. Just get me out of this situation. But Paul, one thing we know about him is that he's so mission-minded. And the other is his confidence in God. And he says, no, what we need when all this is happening, before all this happens, even when it's happening, we need a revival among the believers. That's one of the things he recognizes right there that we need more than anything else because what happens with revival is that a spark becomes a flame. And a flame becomes a raging fire. It's a passion for Christ that does not quit you know when you when you look at when you look at what the world does right now what the world tries to do is oppress the excitement and the hope that the church has it tries to really push it down and smother it out because if that happens the light is extinguished and nobody is drawn to christ paul says i want the opposite to happen As the persecutions rage, as all these things going on, I want to see an excitement go out about the church. I want the Word of God to go out swiftly to all corners. I want people to get excited over Jesus Christ when all this is going on. And look at the church in Thessalonica during this time. Again, it is under persecution, much like many of the churches that we see throughout Paul's journeys. It's under persecution, and yet Paul calls for a revival. That's almost the opposite of what we're seeing today. We're seeing where churches are calling for political activism. We're seeing where they're calling for churches to, uh, to really prepare, to hunker down. And Paul does the exact opposite. He says, I'm not talking politics. I'm talking personal revival. I'm not talking about hiding. I'm talking about getting out in the middle of it. Paul says, I want you to be on fire for Jesus Christ. That the Word may go out swiftly. The other thing that he requests is protection. Notice it's secondary, but he does ask for it. He says, he says right here, he says that the Word of God may be swiftly and glorified and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for not all have faith. That's a good prayer request. I pray that myself. But when you come to the next part, you have a confession. A confession of faith. A confession to say, I believe. Because the very, first, the very first phrase that you see in this next part is God is faithful. God is faithful. I remember I took my son, 
I, I took Aiden out with me here a while back. We had opening day of archery season. I thought, I oh, will give it a try. So we go out. We came back empty-handed. But here we, we go give it a try. So we go out early in the morning. I've got my son with me. We get ready to head out in the woods. He goes, Dad, it is dark. I said, yeah. I said, it's early, son. It's going to be okay. He said, this is creepy. I don't like this. I don't like this. This is creepy. He's hearing all kinds of noises that he, he's not heard before. He's like, what was that? What was that? I said, son, it's okay. We're, we're fine. He goes, no, I don't like this. I don't like this, Dad. I said, son, it's okay, look. And I pull out of my pocket, I said, I got a flashlight right here. I said, it's going to be fine. We're going to make our way back. Hopefully we don't scare anything. And he says, dad, I, I don't, I said, look. I said, son, just walk beside me. Just step where I step. Step where I step. I got a flashlight. I'm not going to lead you astray. Step where I step. And then all of a sudden it hit me. Isn't that what it means when it says God is faithful? doesn't mean that God's going to take away the fear factor, but it means God's going to lay out a path before me where it's safe to walk. Part of Paul's confession is to say, I want to be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. I want you to pray for this. I want you to pray for revival in a wicked time. I want you to pray for that. But I also want you to understand that in spite of all that you see, God is faithful. Paul's in chains at this point. He's under house arrest. He knows he's going to be executed at some point. And yet he tells the church, God is faithful. That's part of the confession. Church, until we get a hold of that, I mean really get a hold of it, you're always going to struggle in your life. You're always going to be plagued with doubts and fears, and it will paralyze you to a certain degree. That's part of why this is Paul's confession. He says, I want you to really grab hold of this. I want you to grab hold of it with both hands and don't let it go. Remember, God is faithful. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to stray. My son walked through the dark, but he knew Dad's in front of me. Dad's got a flashlight. It's going to be okay. He may not be able to see his step as clearly as I can, but he knows I've already been there. And he says, I can move forward. That's very similar to you and I. We may not be able to see every step clearly, but we know God has already been there. Look at the next part of the confession. Not only does he say the Lord is faithful, he says, but he will establish you, he will guard you from the evil one. He will establish you and guard you from the evil one. We say today, we read that and we say, well, there's a lot of evil in this world. There's a lot of evil, but there's only one source for that evil. And sometimes that's easy to forget. There's only one source for the evil, and it's Satan himself. And that's what Paul prays protection for, that he may deliver you from the evil one. Not all the offshoots, the one evil one. Remember, the Bible challenges us. It says, don't fear him who can take away your life and things, but fear him who can take away your eternity. And this is where the Bible really comes into play and says we need to be rest and assured that God is not only faithful, but He will deliver me from the evil one. And this is part of Paul's prayer to the church. When we go on down to the next part, he tells them this, and we're going to get into this more as we go forward this morning. But it says, And now we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you will do and that you will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Part of the challenge is following instruction. That's a hard one at times. The Proverbs say a wise man follows instruction. Sometimes I get kind of bullheaded and I want to go my own direction. And the Lord tells me, says, you're going to get in trouble for doing that. But I'm stubborn at times. And I want to go my own way. For a Christian believer, for us to be successful in our walk for God, we've got to be humble enough to follow the instruction of God. And sometimes that's acknowledging that I need to change something about my life. When Paul's teaching the church, he's encouraging them, stand fast. That doesn't mean to stop growing and learning new things in the Lord Jesus Christ. It means to be rooted in the knowledge that God is faithful, that God is just, that He's giving me good commands, that the commands I need to follow. 
And in that, I'm going to have to listen to His instruction and follow Him, even if it means changing some things about myself. I've seen Christians for years, and we're bad about this. We say, well, this is how it's been done forever. This, this, is, this is how we do it. Maybe the way we do it is wrong. I remember there was a story I was told years ago I thought was really good. A woman was preparing for Thanksgiving dinner, had the turkey set out. She had a ham to go with the turkey. She grabs the ham, and she cuts the butt off the ham. And her, her daughter looked at her. She said, Mom, why did you cut the butt off of the ham? She goes, I don't know. She said, it's the way my mom always did it. This daughter was curious, so she went to her grandmother. And she said, Grandma, I was talking to Mom and I asked her and she told me that you might know the answer. Why did you always cut the butt off the ham when you went to cook it? She goes, Sweetheart, I don't know. That's how my mom always did it. This young girl was blessed that she still had her great-grandmother. So she goes to her great-grandmother. She says, Grandma, why did you cut the butt off the ham? And she patted her on the hand. She goes, Sweetheart, she said, I never had money to buy a big enough pan to put the ham on. I always had to cut the butt off to fit it on my pan. Sometimes the way we've always done things isn't the way that we're supposed to. That's why Paul says, I want you to follow instruction. I want you to learn as you walk for God that you may be prepared for the things that lay ahead. Sometimes we may need to change our approach because the way we've done it isn't the way that God desires for us to. In Psalm chapter 40, go ahead and turn there with me. In Psalm chapter 40, starting in verse 1, we start being introduced to a proverb. Now, this is a good proverb, I, a, a good psalm. It's always meant a lot to me. But in Psalm, in psalm chapter 40, verse 1, it tells us, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined to me. And He heard my cry, and He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. He's put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such turn aside to, to lies. Verse 1 of this, of this psalm tells us, I waited patiently for God. I didn't get in a hurry. I was stuck in that pit for a while. And man, that's hard to do. When you're wrestling with different struggles and problems, when fear is overtaking you and overwhelmed you, when you don't know where to turn and you're stuck there, it is a very unpleasant place to be. Have you ever been to a point where you've been so overwhelmed by things in this world that you're in tears praying to God and you don't hear an answer? And you're just saying to yourself, I want this to end. I want to get out of this. I want to, I want to feel victory again. I want the load lifted off my shoulders. And when discouragement starts to set in and you almost start to get angry to say God doesn't hear me God doesn't care things are getting worse they're not getting better I'm stuck here I don't know what's going on and we start blaming everybody anger's blind it just kind of goes out every which way it fans out and we start getting mad at family friends spouses neighbors we get mad at everybody because we're stuck in a pit and we cannot get out in the very first verse, the psalmist describes, I waited patiently. I waited patiently. If you go back to the Scripture we opened with, patience was one of the things Paul asked prayer for. Patience is such a key virtue for a believer. you got to have it. Because if you don't, you will never get to where you're supposed to be. I've known so many people young, starting off in life, they get excited and they want everything their parents have. They want the two cars. They want the big house. They want everything their parents have because this is successful. This is the way life is supposed to be. They drown in debt. They fall on their face and say, what happened? You never learn patience. You went for the goal before laying the foundation. The psalmist writes, 
He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And He inclined to me. He heard my cry. And He brought me up out of the pit. You know, part of the problem with shadows is they cause panic. That's one of the biggest problems with shadows. They cause panic. And people who panic are oftentimes not wise in what we do because we're in panic mode. The psalmist here, he is stuck in a problem. He's stuck in something he can't get out of. And he's calling out to God. And in his mess, he waits. He waits. When I was a young boy, I had a friend, and we went down to the riverbank, and we were looking for crawdads. We were young teens. We wanted to find some crawdads. We were going to do some fishing. And as we're looking for crawdads, we come to a place in kind of this riverbank where it kind of branches off into a creek. And the creek was dry at that point. There's no water. It's still wet. It's, it's still very muddy, but it, it, there's no water there. And so my buddy, he jumped over the creek, and he's still going down looking for crawdads on the bank. I go to jump, and my foot slips on the edge, and I fall right into the mud. I'm caked in mud. I look like swamp thing. And I try to climb out, and the moment I do, my feet sink in the mud. I sank about yay deep in that mud. And I'm trying to pull myself out. I can't get out. I'm pulling my leg. It's like a suction cup that's got a hold of my leg. Every time I try to climb up, I'd fall back into the mud. I'm covered in the back part of, of, of it, just in mud, just caked. I fall forward in the mud. I get caked forward in, in the mud. My friend is laughing himself into oblivion on the bank thinking it's hilarious. I'm calling out. I'm saying, help me. My friend, he's such a good buddy. He said, what for? He was enjoying the show. After a while, he did help me. And I managed to get out of the mud. Caked from head to toe in it. Had to reach in and get my shoes after I got out because it wouldn't let go of my shoes. That's what it's like being in a pit. You can try every way you want to get out, you're not going to get out. The harder you try, the bigger mess you're going to make. If I had just waited patiently, if I just stood there and waited for my friend to have his good laugh, I wouldn't have been caked in mud like I was. But because I tried on my own, I got covered. I panicked. Because I panicked, I made everything so much worse. A shadow. Not knowing how to get out, but knowing I'm stuck. Creating all kind of mess and chaos. And I got to see the final result. I was a mess. The psalmist says, I've learned to be patient and wait on God. And when he heard me, he turned to me. He grabbed me by my hands and he pulled me up out of the miry pit. He set my feet on a rock. And then he said, now I know I'll be saved from my enemies. Now I know. And that's where we come down here to verse 3. It says, he put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not respect the proud, nor as such turn aside to lies. Look at this at the very first, the very first part of the message today. God is faithful. We see it here. God will strengthen. We see it here. God will protect. We see it here. It says love instruction. We see it here. Everything about getting out of that pit we just read in the very beginning. And the revival part almost comes at the very end because once he's out, he says, many are going to see this. And they're going to rejoice. And they're going to say, God is wonderful. God is faithful. God is amazing. And be turned to Him. See, oftentimes people look at our mess. They know we're in a mess. They know we cannot fix it. And they're waiting to see what God is going to do. Will God deliver you in your distress? That's why we can see that God's Word sustains life in dire situations. 
It sustains us. In the absolute worst of circumstances, God's Word gives us life to go forward to say there's hope for tomorrow. The man who doesn't have God says the best day is today. The man who has God says the best day is yet to come. And you have people say, oh, wait till election day. Say, ha, my God's already been there, done that, took care of it. I trust Him. You wait until God shows up. Because He's going to bring me out of that pit, out of that miry clay. He's going to set my feet on a rock. I'm not going to be scared over a shadow. I'm going to rejoice in the light of the One who's coming. God is coming. And He's going to bring us up out of that pit and set my feet on a rock. Church, rejoice and have revival in your hearts because God is faithful and His Word gives life. We go forward in Scripture to Mark chapter 12. Go ahead and turn there with me. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 41. Mark chapter 12. We're going to see a great woman of faith in this passage. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 41. Going to verse 44. Here's what we read. Mark 12, 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came, threw in two mites, which made a quandrons. So he called to the disciples, he called the disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly I say to you, that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had. Her whole livelihood. I'm going to stop there for a moment. I've heard a lot of preachers talk about tithing when reading this passage. I'm going to tell you the passage is more about trust and faith than it is about tithing. This woman here was what we call today dirt poor. She was poorer than old Joe's turkey. She was absolutely poor. She didn't have two pennies to rub together hardly. That's all she had in the whole world. And when she went into the temple that day, here was her attitude. I trust the Lord. All I have are two pennies. I might be able to get some bread today, but I want to honor God. She put in all that she had. And she said, God, my life is Yours. Do with me what You want. And Jesus looking at her, He says, that right there is what I'm looking for. That right there is what I've been waiting to see. Boy, that's a revival in your hearts. A woman living in a wicked culture where the emperor declares himself to be God. In a culture that's oppressing her people. Oppressing her country crucifying people almost every day in a country that's filled with blood and dismay a country that's on the heels of what the world would consider annihilation she goes up to the temple and she says god here's all that i have take it and do what you will and god says this right here is what i'm waiting to see watch what i do with this one you say pastor what did he do God apparently says that's not our concern because He doesn't tell us. But what He does say is this is what I want. This is what I want. He calls His disciples over and He says, look at her. He doesn't say, look at the people who look good. Don't look at the people who have all that the world has to offer. Look at her. Say, God, why should I look at her? She's lost her spouse. She's dirt poor. Maybe she doesn't even look that good. Maybe she's dirty. She doesn't have anything to her name. God says this woman sees what's important. She's not distracted by everything else going on. She's not looking at all that's being said and trying to cling to the last little bit that she has. But she's giving what she has to me so that I can take care of her. This is your example. This is your example. It's amazing to me how many Christians today 
base their faith off of what they see going on in the world. Church, it shouldn't matter if the world is set on fire. Our faith is still in God. It shouldn't matter if it's being ripped apart from end to end. God is still in control. God still has things in the palm of His hand. And God still cares for you. As the Apostle Paul was telling the church, all the apostasies, all the false teaching, all the evil men that's going to happen, all the falling away that's going to take place, he says, I want you to stand fast and I also want you to learn to pray for me. Pray for me as I pray for you. He says, pray for revival. That's an odd request in such a state. He says, pray that we remain faithful. Pray that we be delivered. Pray that all these things happen. And when you pray, remember, God is faithful. When you pray, remember, God will protect. When you pray, remember the power of Almighty God. I, often, I oftentimes ask myself, what am I missing? These men lived in horrible times, and yet they have more confidence now than many of us have today. And I look at it and say, what did I miss? These men were eyewitnesses of God and His majesty, and when they saw it, it drove out the fear of this world. That's why when we look at this passage in Mark, we learn that hope and desperation, hope and desperation produces a powerful testimony. That woman that day went into the temple not expecting anybody to notice her, anybody to remember her. She was walking her walk. She put her few pennies in, and God said, I see you. And today, over 2,000 years later, we're still talking about her. We're still talking about the woman who put two pennies in. Not the one that came in and put the equivalent of millions of dollars into the temple. Not the one who built the new wing onto the temple. We're talking about the woman who put two pennies into the offering and said, I trust God. We're talking about her 2,000 years later. Her hope in a desperate situation produced a testimony that encourages people even today. Even today, it encourages people. And it shows us that God notices true acts of faith. One example, one, one quote I brought with me today, I thought you'd all enjoy seeing it, is from Albert Einstein. We know who he is. Very famous man throughout history. One of the most intelligent men the world has ever known. And he states in an article posted to the Saturday Evening Post, October 26, 1929, he says, no one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. That is from Albert Einstein. Now, if one of the most intelligent men the world has ever known can state that God is not a myth, that Jesus was not a myth, shouldn't we also believe it? This is the man who wrote Relativity. That, that, that taught the scientific community, a secular scientific community, what science is really all about. And he says, hey, i got one more lesson for you. God is not a myth. V8 moment. I missed that lesson. He says, I want you to get a hold of this. And if God is not a myth, then His Word is not a lie. Then that means God is faithful. That means that God does care. That means that God will pull me up out of the miry pit. That means that God will answer me when I call on His name. That means if I learn to follow His instruction, if I live according to His Word, that I'm going to find victory where there is no victory. That's what that means. It means my faith is not misplaced. It means that every single knee will bow to Jesus Christ. That is not an if, and, or maybe. It is a definite. Every knee will bow. Man, what a day that will be, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? All the different people we've seen throughout our life that have mocked God, that have cast dispersions on Him and on His people, one day have to stand before God Himself, stand before Jesus Christ, and we get to watch Him bend a knee. I hope God lets me walk Him up the aisle. Say, hey, let me introduce you to Jesus. Let me introduce you as they bend a knee and say, you are King of kings. You 
our Lord of Lords. To go on to the next slide, please. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, if you want to go ahead and turn there with me quickly as we wrap things up, but 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, it tells us, but we have this treasure and earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. You know, one thing we find in this, great trials produce great treasure. Trials are never fun to go through. Trusting God when everything is falling apart, that's not an easy ask. That's a hard thing. To march forward not being able to see a way to be delivered. To walk forward not knowing what tomorrow brings. God never said that'd be easy. Neither did any of His disciples. That's not an easy thing. But in this passage, He tells us that while all these things are pressing on the outside, we're not defeated. We feel the pressure. We feel the pain. We feel the struggle. But they don't defeat us. My wife, when we got married, I bought her an engagement ring. And in that ring, there's a small little diamond. Just a little diamond. If you ever ask yourself, I wonder how they get a diamond. It starts off as a lump of coal. Diamonds cost hundreds, even thousands of dollars. A lump of coal costs pennies. You go get a lump of coal and buddy, it just... Who would want to wear that on their finger? I'll take the Kingsford brand. I'll take the Kingsford brand. Make me a ring out of that. Nobody wants that. <clears throat> it's ugly. It's dirty. Nobody wants it. But if you take that and you put extreme pressure on that lump of coal, you eventually get something so beautiful the entire world desires for it. A diamond. Something that is one of the hardest substances in the world. A diamond. Beauty, radiant, sparkles. But it started as a lump of coal. You read this in 2 Corinthians, it tells us that we are hard-pressed on every side. Much like a diamond. We're perplexed. We go through persecutions. We go through trials. But something's produced in the end. Something comes out of that that the world wants more than anything and they can't have without Christ. You don't see what God's creating in you today. It's easy to miss. We see the problems we go through. We see those. We see those. And we don't like them. Rightfully so. But God says, I'm doing a good work in you. I'm doing something. Trust me. The Apostle Paul starts, pray for me. I'm doing a work God called me to do and it's hard. Pray for me. And he prays for the church to have a revival moment. You go further in Scripture. And we read of the psalmist David. And he says, man, I've been down in that miry pit. But he says, I'm waiting for God. I'm patiently waiting. He's not grabbing me right away, but I know He's coming. I'm waiting for Him. We go further in Scripture. And here we come to this. And God says, you wait for Me. You trust Me. And you're going to see something incredible. You're going to see something that you cannot imagine. It's absolutely beautiful. What is God trying to create in you today? Maybe it's a patience to say wait just a little bit longer. Maybe God's creating in you a perseverance to push through the hardest times to get, through some, to, get to something so much better on the other side. What's God creating in you? 
just the other day. I'll, t- I'll share this story and then we'll, we'll uh, get ready to close music and start coming forward. I had a chair, or I have a chair. It was giving me a lot of fits. I took it to a friend. I said, hey, I think we can fix this if you could weld a piece onto the side of my chair, kind of get that frame to stay together, fix it. And it worked. It, it made it work a lot better. But for whatever reason, it didn't fix it completely. And I thought, I'll live with it. It's working a lot better now than it did. Boy, haven't you been to that point in life before? This isn't great, but I'll live with it. it it's a lot better than it was. Then my wife come over to me. And she said on my lap, she goes, we need to spend more time together. About that time, crack! I looked at her and said, you broke my chair! I shouldn't have said that. That got me in a lot of trouble. I leaned the chair up and I looked at it and I said, now. I said, okay. Now I can see what's going on. There was a piece getting ready to break. It hadn't broken yet. But when it did, I could see it. I said, I can fix this. So I drill out the spot that broke. I put a new bolt in it. And it works better than ever. It works perfect. I would never have found it had it not been broken. I never would have found it had it not been broken. Sometimes God brings us to a point where we break so that He can show us exactly what it needs to be healed. What we need to be healed. If we go on to the last slide, please. Louis Zepparini. Many of you may not have heard of him. He was an Olympic runner back in the day. Actually ran in the Olympics in Nazi Germany before World War II. He was an amazing, amazing man. Lived a hard life. He's had two movies made about his life. One is a movie you're all familiar with probably called Unbroken. Another movie later was the second part of how he got saved, how he came to Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. Louis Zepparini was one that was considered an undesirable in his day. Chased down by the government to be sterilized so, they'd never have, so he'd never have any kids. They never caught him. He could outrun them. He was a man who fought in World War II. Planes shot down over the ocean. Stranded, floated in the ocean for weeks. I think even maybe over a month, floated out in the ocean. Almost starved to death. He writes in his book, he could feel the sharks bumping up against his raft during the night trying to get to him. Rescued by the enemy, sent to a POW camp, tortured, sent to another POW camp that was worse than the one before, almost beaten to death, almost starved to death, finally rescued, overcome by bitterness, alcohol, So many things. Almost killed himself a number of times. Finally met the Lord. And this is what he says about God. Looking back on his life, he says, God knew my needs and took care accordingly. He was broken. And then God could fix him. Say, Pastor, I don't need to be fixed. That's pride talking. We all need to be fixed. We all have problems. None of us can save ourselves. We're lost in the shadows without help. But God in the infinite mercy has given us a living hope. A light to get us back to where we need to be. Louis Zepparini in all his life and all the evils and things that he witnessed and went through finally found out that God was with him in that raft in the ocean. That God was with him in the POW camps. That God was with him when he was ready to end his life and start and and just leave it all behind. God was with him in it all. And finally in his old age, when the shadows were cleared and he could finally see the light of day, he says, God has been with me in all my journeys and all my struggles and all my pain. God has been with me in every single step of the way. Albert Einstein, 
a man who was mocked, a man who was put in a special ed class because he was so intelligent the world didn't know what to make of him. He says there is a God. There is a God. He said Jesus is real. He comes off the page. His personality pulsates through the Word. He is no myth. And now today, the world once again puts shadows and darkness all around us. The news constantly bombarding us with bad reports. Evil things going on around the world. Telling us to expect the worst and the worst and the worst and the worst. People panicking on every corner. I, I think sometimes if somebody were to sneeze, we'd run and buy toilet paper. We're scared to death over everything that might happen. And God tells us in His Word, I did not come to bring you a spirit of fear. This is God speaking. I did not come to bring you a spirit of fear, but of life and life more abundantly. Church, you can let go of the fear. You can live in victory in Jesus Christ. You can have a future and a hope that you've never known before. It's there for you if you're willing to claim it in Jesus Christ. To get it, you've got to start letting go of what you can't control and hold fast to what you know is true, which is Jesus Christ. To finally get to that place where you say, Lord Jesus, I love You more than anything this life has for me. I love You. Father, if You want all that I have, I surrender it willingly. I just want You. I only want You. Things get so cloudy when we're overwhelmed by this life. But if You take a moment and just step back and take another look, I promise you, you're going to see where God has stood with you at every single turn. I promise you will see Him. Louis Zipperini saw Him. He finally saw Him. It took a while, but He finally could see God's taking care of me. And I promise you'll see it too. Paul told the church, he said, there are things coming that can bring fear on you. He told the church, the Antichrist is coming. The falling away will happen. But he tells the church, you don't have to lose your hope. You don't have to live in fear. Because God stands with you. You have peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. He won't let you go. Psalm chapter 40. I waited patiently for God. I don't like that part. I know where I am. I'm in a pit. I'm stuck in the clay. I can't move. Whatever comes at me, I can't run away from it. I'm completely stuck. I've tried to climb my way out. I pull more down on me. I'm stuck. And I cry out to God saying, I'm stuck! And I don't hear an answer. God, do you hear me? I'm stuck! Still no answer. I panic. I claw all the more. I try to climb out. I can't get anywhere. And the psalmist tries to call me and he says, listen to me. Listen to the first part of my story. I waited. I waited patiently. I know he, He'll come. I know He'll save me. I waited patiently. When I finally calm down, when I finally take a deep breath and I rest in God's promise, there's a hand reached down to me. He took me by the hand. He lifted me out of the miry clay. I can, I can see it just dripping off my legs. 
and he set me on a rock. Now I know. Now I know. I'll be saved by my enemy. I'll be saved from my enemies. They can't hurt me. Dad's by my side. When Aiden and I walked through the woods, buddy, it was scary for him. But I reminded him, your dad's right here. Son, I won't let anything happen to you. And he walked right behind me. Never left my side. Today, church, I remind you, God has got you. He's walking by your side. Don't be distracted by the shadows. Don't be lost in the darkness. Trust Him. He cares for you. Whatever need you have, whatever prayer you need to pray, for anything God has laid on your heart this morning, I invite you to this altar. Take a moment and spend with Jesus. You will not regret it. Whatever need you have, whatever prayer you need to pray, I invite you this morning. Please come.